Um, first, let me thank our friends at Jones Day who <coughs> have uh, provided us both this wonderful venue and these wonderful hors d'oeuvres. We have somebody from Jones Day in the room who I can thank personally. Wow, no, they just provided us. Ah, there we have somebody. Thank you. I should note there has been an upgrading of the hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> is that because Tom is here? Is that the idea that there's some That's Princeton Jones Prince, Day Princeton, relationship Princeton. here? But um, I, I, you know, I thank you all for coming. I, I really have a great job because you know I'm actually paid to read this book. That's my job is to read this book, and it's great when a great friend writes a great book. This is just a terrific book. As I sat there flying back from Beijing the other day and reading it, you know, normally I sleep about 10 hours on those flights, but this took a lot away from my sleep. I had to stood up, I stayed up, and I read My it. wife says it's the reverse. No, really. <laughs> it's a good sleeping pill. But the, um, it, it's just the clarity with which it talks about U.S.-China relations, the balance with which it talks about U.S.-China relations, that we have both, you know, it, it, it just so clearly kind of lays out what is going on, why it's going on, what we should do about it. It's just, it's just a must read. And it is available outside for sale if you care to purchase it. And in addition to getting the book, you get the author here who will sign it after the program. But Tom needs no introduction. He, you have got his bio. Um, he is, you know, we have this, I think I've talked about it before, this public intellectuals program, which is a program where we identify young experts in China and we try to train them to become public intellectuals. And quite simply, Tom Christensen is the model for that program, that a life in academia and then joining the government and serving as a deputy, deputy assistant secretary of state for China, Taiwan, Mongolia, really has made this extraordinary jump from academics into government back into academics and taken that accumulated expertise and put it into this wonderful book. But let me just welcome Tom. He'll speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have our normal questioning. But thank you for, be thank you for being a director of the committee for years. Thank you for writing this book, and thank you for contributing to the relationship. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, thanks to Jones Day, and thank to Steve and Margot Landon who contacted me to put this together. Uh, I'm a longtime uh, fan of the National Committee, and I served on the board uh, with great pleasure for, for many years. I probably violated the constitution of the organization I served on the board so many years. but. Um, the uh, occasion today is a happy one for me because uh, I get to present my book in, in front of uh, Steve and, and, and all of you, and I, I'm grateful for you coming tonight. Uh, the book really deals with what I see as two challenges that are attendant to China's rise, the challenges to the United States and to its allies and security partners in Asia in particular. And um, the first challenge is a security challenge, and I think that security challenge is often missed by uh, commentators, pundits, uh, and even academics in the United States who believe that China is either trying to do one of two things, drive the United States entirely out of East Asia, or become a rival superpower around the world to surpass the United States over time for global supremacy. Um, I don't see either of these as the real problem. Um, I don't think China, uh, there's evidence that China has a persistent strategy to drive the United States out of East Asia. It could happen, and if it was attempted, it would be extremely destabilizing, but I don't see persistent evidence that that's China's strategy. And I don't think China has the capability and won't have the capability for decades to come to become a global uh, superpower rival of the United States. So I think those, that kind of narrative misses the point. Um, but the good news ends there. China doesn't need to be a superpower peer competitor of the United States to pose real security challenges for the United States and its allies. East Asia is very important for the United States and the rest of the world. It's obviously important for US allies in Asia, uh, the region. And China is already powerful enough to destabilize East Asia badly. And China will only become more powerful on that score 
in the decades to come. So I take China's military modernization, the growth of its economy, and the growth of, growth of its diplomatic footprint very seriously, even though I don't think China's going to take over the world or surpass the United States in overall power anytime soon. Um, that's the security challenge. I'll return to that in a minute. The second challenge, I think, is actually even more difficult for the United States to deal with, and that is the global governance challenge. And the story goes basically like this, that China is still a developing country with lots of problems at home, and it's a developing country with a very large post-colonial nationalist chip on its shoulder. But it is also by far the largest and most powerful developing country in history. It's already a great power despite its status as a developing country. And the world is so integrated now because of globalization that all of the great powers need to pull persistently in a positive direction to deal with global governance issues, problems, that could destabilize the international system from which they all benefit. Um, if China obstructs those global efforts, the efforts will almost certainly fail. But even if China says we're a developing country, don't ask us to contribute to, pro to solving problems far from our shores, it will be very difficult to solve those problems because of China's overall size and its footprint in a globalized international economy and its diplomatic footprint in major institutions and its diplomatic footprint in bilateral relations with many countries around the world. Never has a developing country been asked to contribute as much as China is currently being, able to, uh, being asked to contribute to solving pro problems far from home. And that issue is only going to grow over time as China's power grows. Um, so that's going to be a big ch challenge. And it's not a challenge that the US government is particularly well structured to deal with, or US allies or security partners are well structured to deal with. So I think that's the bigger of the two challenges. Let me turn to the security issue first. And the security issue is really a regional one. And as I said to Steve recently in our podcast, um, I'm not picking on China here when I say that China's rise will cause frictions with its neighborhood, with, in its neighborhood and could lead to uh, conflicts, crises that destabilize that neighborhood. I say that because in 2000 I published an article with my colleague Richard Betts at Columbia University in which we argued if China handles its rise in its region as badly as the United States handled its rise in its own region in the late 19th century, we're in for big trouble. Uh, the Spanish-American War was almost entirely avoidable. Uh, it led to a giant counterinsurgency war in the Philippines, and it was driven by China, U.S. Uh, almost adolescent uh, diplomacy, a new, new power rubbing against its neighbors in new ways, and jingoistic nationalism at home, something that uh, one can imagine happening in China, given the current forces there, and given China's new relationship with its neighbors, its newfound power and power projection capabilities. So. Uh, China's neighbors and the United States uh, and its allies need to dissuade China from settling long-standing disputes with its neighbors, and there are many disputes. I'm sure you know that. And I'm going to go to my own second of two slides. I'm not a big PowerPoint person, which is the map. Um, it has many disputes with its neighbors and um, need to dissuade China from settling those long-standing disputes through coercion or the use of force, and thereby destabilizing the region, and encourage China to try to gain influence and settle that post-colonial nationalist chip on its shoulder through cooperation, trade, and diplomacy. Um, that's the real security mission. And China uh, has had fast growth in its economy, as you know, and it's had even faster growth since 1999 in its military. And a traditional military, a land army that had two missions, uh, basically protecting the Chinese Communist Party against domestic and international foes. And Chinese security starts with the Chinese Communist Party. It's first, second, third, and fourth. So you think of the military as a party military designed to protect the, the party against domestic and international foes. And that land army, which had very little power projection capability on the mainland, was accompanied by a relatively rudimentary nuclear force with liquid-fueled missiles, uh, by public reports with warheads that weren't mated with the missiles um, that would have a ver relatively slow deterrent response against the nuclear powers that might threaten the PRC. In recent years, China has really developed for the first time significant power projection capabilities. Not the ability to dominate East Asia against the uh, 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 resolute United States and not the ability to dominate the world, but the ability to raise costs to the U.S. in this crucial region. The ability to get uh, air power, missile power, submarine power, naval power offshore for the first time. 
And that really poses a lot of those new challenges that I talked about before. These are largely asymmetric capabilities against uh, what are recognized in Chinese uh, security writings as a superior potential foe. Um, they include the following assets that are of, of note, accurate, conventionally tipped ballistic missiles, road mobile uh, ballistic missiles uh, with solid fuel, um, um, uh, solid fuel power, uh, including an anti-ship ballistic missile, if public reports are correct, the ability to strike uh, moving targets at sea, uh, above, the, above the sea surface. Um, submarines, sophisticated submarines, some of them relatively quiet, uh, uh, diesel electric submarines that can do a few missions that pose challenges to superior naval forces. They can lay sophisticated sea mines, they can shoot sophisticated torpedoes, and they can fire cruise missiles. Um, there are other cruise missiles that can be fired from surface ships. There are advanced aircraft and uh, what some people don't pay enough attention to, air defenses that China has purchased from Russia and reverse engineered that project a kind of um, umbrella off the Chinese coast that make it difficult for superior air forces uh, to operate there. There is anti-satellite uh, capabilities that could attack what's called C4 ISR capabilities, <coughs> the ability of superior foes uh, for China to observe and coordinate their military forces in China's neighborhood. Um, uh, if you can attack low Earth orbit satellites, you can reduce that superiority of that potential foe. Um, and then you have uh, cyber capabilities that can slow down the response time of the United States and allies if it slows down the logistics capabilities of those militaries projecting power into China's neighborhood. Finally, there's nuclear modernization, and I'll return to this in a minute. China is turning that rudimentary nuclear deterrent into a more sophisticated one with solid fueled road mobile nuclear missiles that would have much faster response time. Uh, accompanied, according to public reports, by submarine-launched uh, nuclear missiles that could be uh, put out to sea soon on uh, nuclear-powered submarines. None of this is domination. None of this matches US uh, military capabilities. Um, but uh, it does pose real challenges by potentially raising the costs of US power projection in this region. And uh, the purpose of this is to either deter the US from getting involved in some dispute that China cares about a lot, uh, or to delay that intervention if the U.S. does decide to intervene, or to drive the U.S. out to make the U.S. reverse its decision if it intervenes. This is not a new Cold War. The Cold War was awful. Uh, we shouldn't look back on the Cold War with nostalgia in any way. It was terrible. I'm glad that the anti-Soviet forces around the world, including the PRC, prevailed in the Cold War. It's good that the Soviet Union is gone. Um, but I will say about this, even though it's not a Cold War, it's in many ways more complicated than the Cold War was after 1962. Not more scary in this broad sense of you know, two, two camps uh, necessarily being against each other, but more complicated in the following sense. Since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, um, the Cold, in the second half of the Cold War since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, it was pretty clear where the lines were between the two camps. Um, with the exception of West Berlin, you kind of knew what was the communist camp and what was the anti-communist camp. And that had a real important role, that clarity, the consensus of where the lines were, had a really important role for coercive diplomacy, for deterrence. We know from human psychology studies, the Nobel Prize winning work of Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, my colleague at Princeton, that the vast majority of humans across gender and culture will take bigger risks and pay bigger costs to defend what they believe is rightfully theirs, the status quo, the recognized status quo, than they will to get new things. There have been exceptions to this rule in history, like Hitler, thank God he was an exception. But the vast majority of actors, including group actors, behave in this way. So the clarity of where the lines were made the Cold War in this one sense, in this one diplomatic sense, easier to manage than what we have in East Asia. Because if you look at East Asia, China claims all this. You can see the cursor, I hope. Otherwise, I had to be a weatherman and walk over there to the map, but I think this will work. So you have this nine-dash line that goes like this. Uh, Vietnam has claims that go out to here. The Philippines have rectangular claims now. They change them. Malaysia has claims that go out here. These overlap. It is my strong belief, talking to diplomats from all of these areas that have claims in the South China Sea, that they all believe that their claims are legitimate, historically based geographically based and consistent with international law, whatever term you want to use, they believe they're legitimate. Why is that a problem? We go back to Tversky, Tversky and Kahneman. 
and there's no recognized status quo. Everybody feels like uh, he is defending, or that country is defending the legitimate status quo, willing to take bigger risks, pay bigger costs, and you have real trouble. That's also true for Taiwan and mainland relations, where there's a sovereignty dispute as well. The dispute is about the sovereign status of the government in Taipei. It's a little bit different. And then you have the Diaoyu or Senkaku Islands above Taiwan between Japan and the United States. So you have the Philippines in one case, a US ally, and Japan in one case, a US ally. And you have Taiwan, a strong security partner of the United States in another case. And you have sovereignty disputes where people take very strong positions that they believe in. And I almost wish they were insincere. It would be easier to deal with the problem if people didn't actually believe that their claims were, were, were legitimate because it's easier according to the theoretical work on psychology, to deter someone from being expansionist than to deter someone from defending what they believe is already rightfully theirs. So in that sense, East Asia is more complicated on the security front. Um, and in addition, and I won't go into this because in the interest of time here, but I do in the book, which is um, there is a dangerous overlap between those conventional coercive systems that I described before and the new nuclear systems of China. You have road mobile, solid fueled, conventionally tipped missiles, and you have road mobile, so solid fueled nuclear missiles, all run by the second artillery, the branch of the Chinese military. You have submarines that put at risk superior naval forces that might project power in a crisis or a conflict into that region, and you have submarines that can launch nuclear missiles. Why is that important? Uh, in in uh, hypothetical scenarios in the future, in crises or conflicts, the way the United States has behaved in recent decades with its superiority is to try to take out the capability of adversaries to put at risk for deployed US forces early by crippling sometimes the command and control, the electronic capabilities of the systems, or the physical systems themselves. If that were adopted against China, a president would have to think about two things. One is, do you want to launch that kind of aggressive attack against a nuclear power? We've never done that against a nuclear power in the past. And a nuclear power that has overlapping systems between the systems that would most likely be targeted and those nuclear systems. And we never had that with the Soviet Union either. So in that sense, I'm not saying it's a Cold War. I'm not saying it's a Cold War. I am not saying it's a Cold War. I'm just saying it's more complicated in many ways in, in, in these aspects than the Cold War was. Okay. There's domestic political problems in China that make the management of these issues more complicated. And in a nutshell, I would say the big change was not so much between Xi Jinping and Hu Jintao. The big change was the financial crisis of 2008. Because from the time of the financial crisis to the present, China has uh, experienced two uh, perceptions or emotions uh, that weren't there before. One is China felt like its power grew on the international stage in a hurry. It was more able to be assertive and solve problems in a, in a proactive way than before because its power position rose very quickly because the United States declined and some of the US allies declined and China uh, st weathered the storm well. And at the same time, the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, was more afraid at home because of the financial crisis because the economic model that helped prop up the government in the reform period seemed to be called into question by the drying up of export markets. And a new model had to be adopted. And that's still a work in progress, as Steve knows, uh, that Xi Jinping's reform program is, is ambitious, but it hasn't been implemented. And it's difficult to implement. And I'm not so sure they even know that it's going to work. So you have a China that's more confident abroad and more worried at home. And if you think of these things like political sciences, scientists do as a two by two table, that's the worst sell in the two by two table for the United States and its allies. A China that's confident abroad and worried at home is more likely to mismanage these new frictions of a rising power in its region than one that is confident abroad and humble, uh, confident at home and humble abroad. Right? That would be a much better combination in terms of course of diplomacy. So I worry about it for that school. Now let's get to the tougher challenge. I don't want to get you too depressed. Uh, there are forces for peace. Uh, I do talk about them in the book. The forces for peace are interdependence. That transnational globalization process that I talked about before is a major force for peace. It's much deeper, the interdependence, and much more significant than the interdependence before World War I, the one that the realists always talk about in my field. Um, and I think that it is a force for peace. And it, all things being equal, it's a, a force for dissuading China from settling many of its disputes by force. And I just want to mention that on the positive side 
before I move on to the other challenge, which is global governance. That same interdependence, that same globalization uh, that has brought countries together economically means that all the great powers, all the great economic powers, all the great diplomatic powers need to contribute actively to solving global governance problems, sometimes from much weaker actors in unstable parts of the world. And those, those problems are non-proliferation uh, or proliferation of, 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 of nuclear weapons and, and delivery systems. Another problem is the maintenance of financial stability and preventing financial instability. Another problem is preventing regional crises and humanitarian disasters that destabilize regions and create potential metastasizing problems that can destabilize the entire system. And then finally, climate change, a very real problem where obviously China has a big footprint. So you have these global governance problems where everybody has to pull in a positive direction, but we've never had a great power as powerful as China that is also a developing country with all those domestic problems I just described. And the way I put it in the book is in 2012, the last year I could get really reliable statistics, by the most generous interpretation or measure, China's per capita GNP was 9,000 US dollars a year. That's purchase power parity, World Bank, that's the maximum inflator. Right? Ecuador had the same per capita income. Nobody's asking Ecuador to solve problems far from its shores and to contribute actively to settling various problems. Why are they asking China? Because there's 1.3 billion people in China at $9,000 a head, and the Chinese economy will soon be the largest in the world. So the other powers have no choice but to ask China. And if China doesn't contribute, eventually it will hurt China itself because China is so integrated into that system. So China's economy is so large that if it maintains normal relations with countries that are targeted, with states that are targeted by the rest of the world, those states will be just fine. So you think about North Korea, or Iran. The biggest economic partner of both North Korea and Iran is Beijing. Um, the rest of the world cannot effectively pressure those states on nuclear proliferation without some degree of cooperation from China. And China says, in the case of North Korea, which I describe in great length, and we have historical relations with them. I go into that in great length in the book. I don't have time to cover all the complex problems with getting China to pressure North Korea. With Iran, they say, you know, you invested in bad places before for energy. We're doing it now. There aren't that many more opportunities in the world. We're going to move into that place. Don't ask us to hurt our own interests, and don't ask us to support you in regime change around the world. Right. We're a developing country, and we need these kind of relationships. And they were very reluctant to pressure Iran during the nuclear uh, negotiations and during that crisis. And it, they may be very reluctant in the future to pressure Iran if the so-called snapback uh, measures are raised if, or if and when, and I would like to, I would like, I, intellectually I would think when Iran cheats uh, on the deal. Um, so it's going to be hard to get China to snap back to the level of sanctions that we saw before. And if, if China maintains normal relations with Iran, it's going to be very, very difficult to pressure Iran. So we have to try to persuade China that it's in China's interest to do this. Um, on financial issues, if China doesn't contribute actively to global financial stability, it's going to be very difficult to maintain during crisis periods. Um, and obviously, China is the biggest uh, per capita, I mean, no, I'm sorry, China is the biggest greenhouse gas emitter, and this will only get worse. China is um, not per capita. China is um, emitting at least twice as many as the United States now in terms of quantity uh, uh, greenhouse gases. And um, that gap is likely only to grow. But China is still a developing country. It's developing later than the United States. And on a per capita basis, right, China emits a lot fewer uh, greenhouse gases than the United States. And on a historical per capita basis, there's no comparison. So if you look at the history of greenhouse gases, because it's a cumulative problem, the UK is by far the worst. The United States is uh, closing into second place. Um, not a great place to be, and China's way down the list. So people have answers, they have responses in China that say, why are you pressuring us so much? If we, on a per capita basis, emitted greenhouse gases like you do, we'd all be underwater. Don't put the burden on us, help us solve the problems. And the problem is if China doesn't actively help on the problems, no one else will help. So if you look in the United States and the US Congress when people say, don't ask us to make sacrifices for 
uh, greenhouse gas reduction, they say we shouldn't do it because China's not going to do its share and we'll lose jobs to China. And that's true in Europe and elsewhere as well. Because China's just so big. And China's such a big emitter of these gases. Um, I mentioned already North Korea and Iran. Uh, very difficult to pressure those regimes on nuclear weapons. Financial stability. I have an example in the book that was very telling to me about this problem of China as the largest developing country in the world. And that was the Greek financial crisis of 2012. This was not an issue that the US government, in my, in my uh, research, put a lot of pressure on China on this issue. But Europeans did and the Australians did in ways that really reveal the problem. Why China had big foreign exchange reserves, Greece was in trouble, and the logic was very tight. The EU as a corporate whole is China's biggest trading partner. Greece could bring down the EU. That would hurt China. China had the cash to bail out the Greeks. So why shouldn't China bail out the Greeks? Well, I go back to 2012. Per capita GNP by the most generous measures in China were $9,000 a head. What was it in Greece? Over 23000 Why was Greece broke? Because of profligate government spending, social safety net, uh, almost unimaginable, 14-month uh, pensions, everybody working for the civil service. What does China have? What does China have? None of that. No health insurance, no, no uh, guaranteed pensions or social security. Right? They have farmers, and I say farmers. I don't know why Chinese peasants are peasants and American farmers are farmers. My uncle was a farmer. If I called him a peasant, he could, take, take, he could and would take my head off. Right? Chinese farmers have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and finally gotten some wherewithal. They're supposed to bail out these fat Europeans. That's the attitude in China. So what happens? Premier Wen Jiabao goes to Europe, and he, he's a communist, and he calls for fiscal austerity. So you guys need to tighten your belts. Right? So why is that the case? Because China is a developing country. And there were blogs, and they did polls on these blogs in China about what do you think of the Australian request that China <coughs> contribute to financial stability in, in Greece? And the answers were, uh, infuriating and laughable were the top two answers. Right? Why would we help these rich Europeans get through their, uh, their, their period of waste? Greenhouse gases, by far the biggest emitter. I think it's a big challenge. Uh, I think it's been handled relatively well recently, but there's not nearly enough progress on it on any, in any country. And I think it's going to be a big problem moving forward, not just in terms of getting China to make the necessary sacrifices, but also uh, just government capacity in monitoring any agreement that they actually reach. I don't know if you saw the Times last week that suddenly it seems that China's emitting a lot more greenhouse gases than anyone knew because there's not really good monitoring. The uh, environmental protection agencies in China are extremely weak. And you have a one-party state where the regulators are almost universally outranked in that one-party state by the people they are regulating. So it's not a well, good structure for that problem. And we're going to have to struggle with that problem going forward as well. Um, in the book, and I, do, I don't have time to go into it because I want to answer your questions, but I want to queue up maybe some of your questions. In the book, what I do is I have the, glo the security challenges, the global governance challenges laid out up front. And then I go through every administration since George H.W. Bush at the end of the Cold War to the present. And I try to call lessons about the successes and failures of each of those administrations in tackling those two problems. Um, so uh, I, could, I could talk about that in the Q&A period, but if I uh, go into that in any detail, I will spend another 10 or 15 minutes talking. And I know that Steve wants me to shut up. So um, <laughs> I will, uh, I will uh, be glad to uh, field your questions now. That's what the book's about. I'm happy to hear criticisms of it. And uh, um, I hope you uh, understand it, even if you don't agree with it. Thanks very much. Let me start off with a couple of questions. One is, is um, in your review kind of of each administration policy towards China, you, you talk about the pivot slash rebalance. And you did not sound like a great fan of it. Uh, tell us why. And, and at this point in time, what should we do about it? OK. I didn't like the rhetoric. I, the, the policies behind the pivot rebalance were fine. Many of those policies were in train before the Obama administration came into office. 
It was the rhetoric I didn't like. I didn't like the rhetoric for a few reasons. One is it was inaccurate. It's never good to have a uh, mobilizational strategy and a, and, a, and a public diplomacy strategy that is inaccurate. On the defense side, almost all of the programs that are publicly discussed as part of the pivot were in train for years before uh, the pivot was, was, was in place. Um, in economics, until the TPP push of recent uh, years, there was basically no economic component uh, to this uh, so-called pivot. Um, and the TPP itself was an idea of four APEC members, non-American APEC members, during the Bush administration. And we had already started to negotiate that. So that wasn't part of the pivot. Where the pivot was real, and I say this in the book, was in diplomacy towards Southeast Asia. There was an upgrade in the number of high-level officials who traveled there um, and the, abil the willingness of the Obama administration to sign the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation and join the East Asia Summit. Um, and become much more involved in the ASEAN regional forum and, and forums like that, and try to make those meetings really meaningful about the real security issues that the region faces, about the maritime disputes and how they're managed. So I, I give the administration high scores on that. But the public rhetoric of the pivot was counterproductive in a few ways. One, not just the inaccuracy, but it suggested that we're pulling out of the Middle East and Afghanistan and we're going to turn our guns on China. So within the Chinese debates, which is something we're trying to affect to get China to play the roles that I described in my talk, within the Chinese debate, it fed into the hawkish narrative that the US was out to contain China, that it was out to hurt China, and it was out to keep China's rise from occurring, which I think is factually inaccurate and politically uh, destructive to have that, uh, that position um, uh, supported. A second problem is it makes it look like the United States has attention deficit disorder and can only handle one problem at once. We're a global superpower in the United States. And if you suggest that we can only really focus on one problem at once, not only does that worry everybody else around the world because you're pivoting away from them, but when problems occur in those pro areas of the world, it's only natural that in the East Asian press, and it did happen, they start saying, well, now they're going to pivot away. Secretary Kerry is distracted with Syria. So he's not going to care about us. And the United States has to be able to do more than one thing at once, and we shouldn't suggest that we can't. Um, so there's that problem as well. And I just I don't like the rhetoric. I do like the policies. And there's a tendency in politics to have product differentiation across administrations. And sometimes that product differentiation causes more problems than it's worth. And I think this is an example of that. I do note that the administration itself stopped saying pivot, started saying rebalance. But I would have preferred that it didn't say either. Um, and just did it, you know, like the old Nike commercial. Right, just, just do, it. do it. I do believe in a very strong U.S. military presence in East Asia. I do believe in a very strong alliance relationship, uh, a set of relationships in East Asia. If that's all part of the pivot, fine. I believe in free trade. I think it's great that we're pushing uh, free trade agreements in East Asia. That's all fine. But just do it. The, in the book you talk about, and, and somewhat make say it's not that important, the, the difference between what you call reactive assertiveness and proactive assertiveness, yeah. which I think is, is, you say in the end to our allies it doesn't matter, whereas I think it makes an enormous amount of difference because if China is reactively assertive, which I believe it is, for if you look from the Diao Yudao down to the Nan Sha Shisha, it's all been reaction to actions by us, by the Japanese, by the Filipinos, by the Vietnamese. That when you look at each of these, you actually see a reaction which we would characterize then as an overreaction, and that this proactive assertiveness where the Chinese actually start doing something which they haven't been provoked into doing, I don't really find examples of that. And it matters in terms of the policy that we create if, depending on which yeah. you believe. I think we just disagree. Um, I see both. And that's why I said about the financial crisis that it put China in the worst possible box, being confident abroad and scared at home. Because the confident abroad part leads to the proactive assertiveness. And I could give a couple examples in a minute of what I see as proactive assertiveness. But it also fuels the reactive assertiveness, which is also disruptive. And to the allies, if they're targeted by the reactive assertiveness, they don't care necessarily what the cause is. Um, and that is because nationalism is a big legitimating tool for the Chinese Communist Party. And Chinese Communist Party elites are reluctant to look weak 
on the defense of sovereignty in the face of provocations from others. And sometimes there are provocations from others. So that's what your, your, your basic point I don't disagree with. I just think it's incomplete. You have both things. You have this uh, land reclamation project, which I think was very, very assertive, very proactive on China's but you, part. You, you, don't, you don't think there were Vietnamese and Filipino oh, sure, reclamation the, projects sure, this, that then provoked the Chinese after saying, don't, don't, don't. Finally, the Chinese are frustrated and they say, all right, we're going to reclaim. And then they reclaim yeah, at 90 I, times the size of the Philippines and the Vietnamese. Yeah. But, it, but that 90, is not proactive. That 90, is reactive. 90 times the size and at a time when it wasn't necessary, there haven't been recent uh, large scale reclamation projects by the other actors. Uh, these are historical facts that they got there first. Um, and this is a very large scale operation and what they're doing on those land reclamation projects are pro is proactive and destabilizing. Uh, the creation of the, 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 uh, the municipality off of Hainan. That reaction to the Vietnamese creation of a municipality. Absolutely re re reaction to what the Vietnamese did. I, I think these were proactive measures it's not proactive, to try to control. It's to try, he, he disagrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> Just if I didn't make that clear. Um, and, and, um, I think there are other uh, military activities that have been proactive, and I think some of them have been reactive. So um, I think you have both. And I think what the challenge for the United States is, is to try to deter the um, proactive use of what's perceived as growing Chinese power in the region in destructive ways, at the same time that you're trying to reassure China that you're not trying to spark uh, unnecessary provocations of Chinese nationalism, either by the United States or the other actors that the United States supports. And you have to do both of those things at once. Well, I have examples in the book where I think it did occur uh, in, the, in the Bush administration, which I served. Um, I think that we did that successfully in cross-strait relations, where we told the mainland that they should not use force against Taiwan. We told the mainland that we were going to provide a large amount of weapons to Taiwan and do uh, defense uh, uh, cooperation with Taiwan, and at the same time, we privately and then publicly opposed initiatives in Taiwan that unnecessarily um, provoked Chinese nationalism by suggesting that Taiwan was going to move unilaterally in the direction of, um, uh, of independence uh, from the Chinese nation on a permanent basis. Um, and I think that balance is what you need. I think in the Obama administration on, uh, the, on, the, um, on the Senkaku Island dispute, I think it was very useful for the president in Tokyo in 2014 to say that the Senkaku Islands are different in American strategy in the region and around the world in that while the United States, as it does elsewhere, doesn't recognize any, any sovereign claims over those islands, it recognizes Japanese administrative control and therefore the alliance applies, which I think helps calm down Chinese assertiveness uh, toward those claims. Even though but, Chinese but, assertiveness but was totally same, a reaction to the but, Japanese nationalization at, of the islands. But at the same time, at the same time, according to all public reports, the Obama administration asked the Japanese to avoid provocative actions. Now the nationalization of the islands, here's a, here's a, a great example. The nationalization of the islands by the Japanese was done to prevent a hyper-nationalist project in Japan to turn the islands over to a group that would almost certainly use the islands for ill in Sino-Japanese relations. Nationalization means nothing in international law. Those islands were claimed by, China, by, by Japan both before and after so-called nationalization. This was a trumped up issue in legal terms and political terms in order to assert Chinese administrative control over those islands to undercut the U.S.-Japan alliance. And I think that a, a robust response was warranted. At the same time, I think you should discourage uh, Japanese politics that unnecessarily provoke Chinese nationalism. So I, I guess that at the end of the day, Steve, um, I don't disagree with you so much because I think there are instances um, of, and I outline them in the book, where especially in 2010, where outside actors took actions that provoked China into what were overreactions for which China needs to be criticized, um, but they were provoked into these overreactions. And there are other instances where I think China simply has said, I see an opportunity to solidify long-held claims that go back to the 1930s. I now have the capacity to do it, and I'm going to do it. And I see that as much more proactive than I see uh, reactive. Yeah, I, I kind of view it almost 
Are you an NFL fan by any chance? Uh, I'm a Jet fan. I don't know what uh, I mean. uh, <laughs> But the, if, uh, anybody who follows professional football knows the guy who gets flagged for the personal foul is the person who retaliates. And that's, yeah. I think, what, what, is, what is too sometimes, often happening. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes it's the, the guy who just but if you falls go, off on someone. You have a wonderful description in the book of um, what happened during the Lee Dung Hui visit. Uh, to the United States, to were you you were teaching at Cornell at that point. I was teaching at Cornell, and and um, how that then ultimately led to China reassessing its military posture towards Taiwan. Once again, a reactive, not a proactive decision. They didn't sit there and say, "All right, we need to rethink this." It was they were confronted with this. We're really helpless in the face of what is going on here, so we need to change what we're doing. Yeah, we need to react. I wouldn't describe it that way, but I, 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 I take your point that they saw something they needed to react to. But I don't know if they felt helpless, and I don't know if their reaction has been constructed. Can I go back to the Senkaku or Dayu Islands? One fact that I haven't seen sort of highlighted or talked about in relation to that uh, conflict in the East China Sea is that Japan made that claim over the islands in 1895. Yeah. And so for the people in our history in these ages, the Treaty of Sumonoseki, the end of the first Chinese yeah. Japanese war. And that is why I think it's so important to the Chinese government. And I think that that analysis, that historical understanding. He took my class. You know, I taught this class. <laughs> <laughs> Did he teach you that? It's all, it's a, yeah. He taught me that way back at Cornell. Where Lee it's prejudice witness dismissed. <laughs> But, I mean, so I think that's important for the Chinese people and maybe the Chinese government yeah. when they make that claim or why those two meaningless yeah. islands actually have meaning. So I'm worried within sort of yeah. America, when I'm looking at that debate, when it does focus on East China Sea, that it doesn't take that into account. Yeah, I think people do, I think in the U.S. government, people do take it into account. It's a lot in the media coverage of every type of issue that is not taken into account. And I don't want to get into the weeds of the Senkaku Diaoyu dispute, but the Japanese claim is that, yes, it was claimed in 1895, but before the Treaty of Shimonoseki, it was claimed as no man's land, which is a legitimate uh, claim under international law. Now, the Chinese narrative is that this was part of the Treaty of Shimonoseki and the great humiliation of the loss of the Sino-Japanese War and was promised back to China in 1943 in the Cairo Declaration. And I'll say this, just as a, you know, I don't want to get into a, a big debate about Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, um, but I will say this, that I think there's a reason that the Chinese would not want to go to an international tribunal to settle this one, because I think Japan would win. And I do believe that if China were willing to, Japan would be willing to, um, because I think Japan has a pretty good case on this one. I think there are big sections of the Spratly Islands, from my understanding, where China would do quite well in an international tribunal. But China's position has been avoid all of that stuff. So um, uh, I, I do think it's more complicated than you laid out, but that is the Chinese narrative. And the Chinese narrative is what affects Chinese behavior, and the Chinese narrative is important in terms of this domestic legitimacy problem. And it's one of the many reasons that I find it uh, disturbing that the Chinese government seems so afraid of its own people right now. Um, because when it feels insecure at home, you don't want to start, you, that's not a good time to start to revise the historical narrative in a way that could lead to accommodation on these disputes whether it be in the East China Sea or the South China Sea. And that's, that's disturbing to me. So I, I, I wish that there was more stability, more voice for the Chinese people and the government, and, and less, uh, less nervousness for the Chinese government toward its own people. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you. Um, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on the Trans-Pacific um, Trade Partnership. There's been a lot of talk about TPP and whether or not you foresee China joining TPP? And if so, when do you foresee that happening? Yeah, uh, I didn't read all 6,000 pages, I confess. You know, it's <laughs> the problem of having a day job. <laughs> but um, in general, I support the TPP effort. Um, and I remember how it started. Um, it started with uh, frustration of the, in the Doha round with a lack of progress in international trade negotiations. And it started with four members of APEC, one of whom was Singapore which made a big difference to us in the United States, that wanted to push a, a trans-Pacific partnership that would include Latin American countries, the United States, and East Asian countries on a high standard for free trade. Because Singapore was the gold standard free trade agreement that the United States had signed in the first term of the Bush administration under the able leadership of Robert Zellick. So that caught our attention, that Singapore was involved. 
And the idea, and I remember it quite well, the idea inside the US government went like this. If we could push this forward, a trans-Pacific partnership involving these large economies, China would not be eligible early on if it was a true gold standard. There's just too much state involvement in the economy. We knew that. But China might be jealous and then might start to make reforms at home that would make it eligible to join. And the hope was that China would join down the line under a high standard and open up its economy for the benefit of China and everybody else. It was not part of a pivot. It was not part of a containment strategy. It was not part of an encirclement or an exclusion strategy. It was very much uh, a logic, a positive sum, economic benefit for all if you could just motivate China to join. That was the initial idea. I believe that never really changed among most of the members. And I think it got caught up in this pivot language. And one of the problems that I have, I am, I'll just say, I've always been uh, an independent. I'm nonpartisan. I served in a Republican administration so proudly. I've always been an independent. But one of the things that just drives me nuts about the Democratic Party is it doesn't believe in trade. So what you have is a situation if you have a Democratic Party president who's pushing the TPP. How does he sell it? What's the first paragraph that President Obama says when he talks about the TPP? If we don't write the rules, China will. Why is he doing that? Is it because he sees it as an encirclement or an exclusion strategy? No. It's because he has to drive it through the Democrats in Congress. So he has to say, this is a big competition with China issue. And even if you don't really believe in free trade, you should get behind this because you don't want China to rule the world. And it's unfortunate that it has to be sold that way. And it has to be sold that way because of what I consider to be backward thinking in one of our major parties on international commerce and trade. And that's just sad. So, it's not about containing China or encircling China or excluding China. It's about not currently including China and in the future including China if China can meet the standards, which if China were able to do would be good for everybody, including China. And that's how we ought to look at economic affairs, it seems to me. Um, this is not a Cold War. I said that three times in a row for a reason. We're not trying to hurt the Chinese economy. And the best way for the Chinese economy to move forward, according to open-minded, reform-minded Chinese uh, 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 officials is to prepare China for that kind of opening. So it should be a win-win situation over the long run. So it's one that really kind of drove me crazy. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and in the, in the oh. back? Oh, oh sorry. sorry. I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Whichever. I, I'm just a diplomat. I can't settle disputes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'd like to ask you something that maybe tries to use the framework you referenced from social science about protecting the status quo and try to apply it to ways that the United States may be forced or, or it might be in the best interest of the United States to change policy in Asia over coming decades. So yeah. besides some of the problems that, that you're looking at now. Uh, specifically, I, I'm sure you're aware that there have been some suggestions by some people that the United States and China could move towards an agreement on surveillance modeled on the Open Skies Agreement between Russia and the United States. Uh, I'm curious if you can help me understand whether, assuming that there would be a lot of resistance to that kind of move, would it be driven more by the sort of symbolic message that it would send about pulling back in Asia or by the intelligence value of the difference between what you can see from a satellite and what you can see from uh, a spy plane going overseas. So that's a specific example, but more generally going forward, do you think there could be a point where our uh, desire to protect the status quo of impunity in Asia could, could lead us away from otherwise wise changes to the way we operate? I think there are a lot of changes. And it gets back to the first question. I, I'll, I'll get to your security question in a minute. But it gets back to the, the earlier question on, on TPP as well. I think the United States is changing lots of things. If there's a revisionist power in the world, it's the United States. So when President Obama said, if we don't write the rules, China will, that's not actually accurate. The issue is, for the TPP, what we're trying to do is write new rules, better rules for international commerce that include services and intellectual property protection. Right? Those are new rules. And China wants to stick to the old rules. So China's the conservative force. And that, that plays out in a lot of different things. On sovereignty issues in the security realm, China sticks to the old 19, early 20th century principles of non-interference in internal affairs and leave states alone if they leave you alone. That won't work in the 21st century, and that's why we have this idea of responsibility to protect since 2005, following the 9-11 attacks, 
saying that we have to hold governments responsible for what happens within their borders, even if they're not involved in the bad actions within their borders, they have to be held responsible for it. Because even in relatively backward parts of the world, or undeveloped, I shouldn't say backward, undeveloped parts of the world, right, um, you can have actors that can destabilize the whole system. So China wants to stick to the old rules, the US wants to revise the rules. So I don't think the US is standing by saying, well, we're just going to hold on to the status quo. I think there are a lot of dynamic aspects to US diplomacy. And the question is, can you convince China to get on board with those things? In terms of transparency, um, the Chinese military modernization program is uh, more transparent than some people uh, let on. There's a lot more information if people try to mine it out of the open source literature uh, in China. But um, it's not nearly as transparent as the American system, which is driven in a democracy where the budgets have to be approved in Congress and every weapon system has to be vetted and you have to talk about the long-term planning. So we see every year, we see how many missiles or planes the Chinese build, but we have no idea what kind of long-term program that, that that's part of. When, where does it stop? What, what's the goal um, uh, of those programs? So it's, it's, it is, a, it is a, a problem in transparency, but I don't think the solution to that problem is necessarily improved satellite imagery. It's probably um, uh, diplomatic and military and military contacts uh, and discussions about strategy in the region. But I think a lot of things could change. And one of the things that was very hopeful um, in the Bush administration years was this idea of a Northeast Asia peace and security mechanism, which came out of the six-party talks process. And one of the biggest obstacles to China doing new things in the security realm is its dysfunctional relationship with North Korea. Because China doesn't want to have persistent security dialogues with the region, uh, uh, because those dialogues will almost certainly include North Korea as a main topic, one, two, and three, in terms of instability, without North Korea in the room. But North Korea's behavior is so horrible that nobody wants North Korea in the room. So China's stuck in this position. A great power is being dragged down by a miserable prison state, which is North Korea. And this, has to, this ties back into Chinese Communist Party legitimacy when I talk about it in the book. And it's a shame. So it makes China more conservative than it needs to be. So a lot of people say, you're worried about China being assertive. And I am when they do ma massive land, land reclamation projects in the South China Sea and put uh, and put uh, tarmacs on them. Yeah, I, I worry about that assertiveness. But I also worry about China's conservative passivity in sticking to the old systems that prevent creative diplomacy that could actually stabilize the region moving forward. That's a long answer. It's a great question, but it's a long answer. Oh, hi. Thanks a lot for this great talk. Um, I have two questions. The first is your, um, what message do you take away and what message do you think China was giving in the recent President uh, Xi's visit to the United States and the meeting between China and Taiwan. And the second thing is um, I've heard people say that uh, China is working within some latitude um, to do things that act on its nationalist instinct and arrest um, up until the point that it will disrupt economy. And do you think China can control that? The unrest will disturb the economy. Is that what you're saying? Unrest? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, anything that it would do really has economic, its global economic benefit in mind. Do you yeah. think that that's true? And can China control certain actions that might disrupt um, its economic growth? Oh, at home. At home. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think China has every incentive, obviously, to, to maintain economic growth. The Chinese Communist Party, it's easy to say China. The main actors here are the Chinese Communist Party. They run the country, and the security interests of the Chinese Communist Party are first, second, and third. And a big part of that security interest is keeping the economic engine going. Because uh, you know it's the reform era since 1978, and nobody really believes in communism as a social economic order in China anymore. That's the kind of dirty secret, right? Um, I often say, if you really want to meet a true believe in communist, come to an American university town. Don't go to Beijing, right? Because they, they, they tried it and they know better. Right? Um, so uh, so they have a, a basic legitimacy problem right there, um, and the way they've handled that is some combination of improving the welfare, and it's been quite dramatic. 
the improvement of welfare of Chinese citizens since 1978, combined with this sense that China's standing up in the world. Now it's the China dream, but there were other slogans before, that China's standing up in the world and it's not getting pushed around anymore. So uh, the, since the economic piece is so important, it gives me some uh, hope that the latter instinct, or the latter leg of the legitimacy, won't take over and, and uh, destabilize the region. Because given the nature of transnational production in East Asia, things aren't so much made in China, they're assembled in China from parts from all over the region. It would be incredibly destructive to the Chinese economy to go on a kind of, forget Germany and World War II, Germany and World War I. If it went on that kind of rampage, it would really destabilize its own economy in a way that would hurt the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. That's a force for peace. So I don't see them um, uh, pushing on that 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 uh, so casually. I do worry, and, and, and you know, I disagreed with Steve before again, not because what Steve said was wrong in my opinion. It's just that I thought it was only half the story. Right? So I think what Steve says is right, that there is a real danger, given this legitimacy problem in China, that other actors will poke China in various ways, and China will overreact in destabilizing ways. So that's a big part of diplomacy as well. You keep a strong presence in East Asia. You keep a strong alliance system in East Asia. You make it look inside those Chinese debates that the hawks look silly and adventurous. Because if they want to solve all their problems through coercion, it looks too costly because you have a strong US presence. But at the same time, you have to dissuade unnecessary provocations of Chinese nationalism if you want to have stability in the region. And that's a big, that's a tough balance. That's what political scientists call the security dilemma. And that's what needs to be managed all the time as China rises. So in the, in the summit, um, you know, a lot of it was uh, pro forma, predictable. Um, there were certain uh, statements made, uh, commitments made that could potentially be quite constructive. One of them uh, on uh, climate change issues. Um, getting China to do anything on climate change, if you, go, if you rewind the film to 2009, is an accomplishment because China was really just stiff arming the world uh, at the beginning of the Obama administration. And now it's coming up with what could be constructive approaches if implemented and actually executed. Um, and then there's the issue of cyber theft, which is a real problem. And I emphasize cyber theft, not cyber espionage. All countries do espionage, right? Cyber theft is the problem. The problem is the systematic stealing of intellectual property um, from uh, Chinese locations, uh, which according to public reports are supported or at least ignored, in many cases, by the Chinese government, that threatens the economic uh, innovativeness of the entire world, innovation of the entire world. Because it's so persistent and so systemic that it harms innovation, not just in the United States, but in, other, in Asian countries, in Europe, and in China itself. Because small entrepreneurs in China who want to come up with clever technological fixes to problems, their stuff is subject to rip off as well. So uh, good noises on that issue, but I would like to see the proof in the pudding that these attacks really stop. And there's a huge emphasis in the United States on this issue of them taking the uh, SF-86 forms, these forms that government officials fill out to get clearances. and I'm very upset that those forms were taken, but I'm mostly upset. My initial reaction was, how did we let that happen? Right. <laughs> how did we let that happen? Right? So some of the stuff you have to look at yourself and say, why aren't you protecting your sensitive materials better than you are? And that's a question of espionage. And that's a different thing than cyber theft. And unfortunately, in the media, they get combined. They get <coughs> I know there's still more questions, but we have, uh, we've run out of time. This is a great book. If you have cared to come to this program, you really must read the book because it is the clearest exposition you're going to get on the U.S.-China relationship. But thank you again, Tom, Thanks for coming lot, from Princeton. Thank you all for being here.